This is Rumble with Michael Moore, and I'm Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. Today's podcast, we have a special guest, the congressman from Northern California, Congressman Ro Khanna. Uh, He is one of the leaders of the Progressive Caucus in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., and he is working around the clock right now to preserve as much of the progressive agenda that is in the human infrastructure bill uh, that is probably going to be voted on uh, sometime by the end of this week or sometime next week. And the fight is on. The fight is on to, to get uh, as much as we can with all of these things that this bill is going to do for children, for the elderly, schools, a whole bunch of things. He will be with us uh, shortly here to give us an update and to tell us what we need to do uh, to fight these Republicans and these uh, corporate Democrats who are standing in the way of what the American people want. So stick around for that because uh, I think uh, he's going to be talking to us live from the halls of Congress. I also want to thank everybody for your feedback on my Substack letter from uh, this past Sunday, one called I Like America and the 13 Reasons Why I Like America. <laughs> It's uh, a Canadian had asked me, what is it that you do like about your country? And I'm like, huh. And I thought about it for a couple of days and I, I made, a, I think, a great list of 13 things. If you haven't read that, please go on my Substack site. It's free. Just type in michaelmore.com. So before we bring on Ro, uh, our congressman here, uh, I want to thank a couple of our underwriters for today. And we have a, a wonderful list of, of people who are backing uh, this podcast and supporting my voice and supporting all of us. So first up, I want to thank Audible. Everybody knows Audible, right? They do a whole lot more these days than just books. They have their own original programming. This last week, I'm on Audible, and I got Jesse Eisenberg and a couple of his friends did this original piece for Audible. It's called When You Finish Saving the World. And I also got uh, an old book from uh, Chris Hedges, and he did an audiobook of it. I didn't know that. It's called War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. I read it when it came out, and it was great then, and I'm looking forward to now listening to it in Chris's voice. Uh, so Audible, they're the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Also, they've got thousands of uh, binge-worthy podcasts on Audible, which are free, uh, including mine, Rumble with Michael Moore. They also have the classics like uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and it's it's read by Lawrence Fishburne. It's so good. The new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. This uh, new author has been around now for a few years. Sally Rooney, Irish writer. I just got her book. So for the listeners of my podcast, you can try Audible for free for thirty days. All you got to do is go to audible.com/rumble. Audible.com slash rumble, or you can text the word rumble to 500 500 on your phone. That's it. So, audible.com slash rumble, or text rumble to the number 500 500, and you'll get a free 30 day trial of Audible. And also, before we get started, I want to thank one more of our underwriters here. It's a company called Human. They make these great Super Beats Heart Chews is what they call them. They're basically gummies that are full of all this great nutrition. So it's a great way to start the day. You pop one of these in or it's a good pick-me-up in the afternoon. It's a great replacement for that afternoon coffee or these energy drinks or candy or anything else that you need, you know, halfway through the day in the afternoon to pick you up. It's also filled with grape seed extract, uh, which is strongly endorsed by my vegan sister. So it's good for the heart, it's good for your blood pressure, and it really tastes great. So you can get a free 30-day supply with your first purchase of these Super Beats by just going to Super Beats, B-E-E-T-S, superbeats.com slash rumble. So you go there, and by just doing slash rumble, you get your 30-day uh, supply uh, for absolutely free, your first supply here. And they provide free shipping and free returns and a 90-day money-back guarantee. So that's all at superbeats.com slash rumble. So 
So here we go with today's guest. My friends, let me state the obvious. We are at a breaking point in Joe Biden's presidency right now, this week. All the major initiatives that we need to get done for the economy, for health care, for the environment, for voting rights, and for our ability to actually hold free and fair elections. They are all up in the air right now. On Wednesday of this week, Senate Republicans blocked passage of the Freedom to Vote Act. Not a single Republican supported the bill. They will live to rue this day. Senate Democrats could pass the sweeping voting rights legislation, but only if they had the guts to vote to end the filibuster. The filibuster is anti-democracy. It is not in the Constitution. It has only mostly been used to keep black Americans from voting, to keep civil rights from happening for all kinds of people. It must go. Tell your senators, it must go. And for the past few weeks, conservative corporatist Democrats in Congress have been chipping away at what Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders have teamed up to create a massive, wonderful $3.5 trillion investment in the American people, an investment that within the bill is already paid for, no additions to the debt of the country, all paid for because in the bill, the rich, the uber rich will start finally paying their fair share of taxes. 55 corporations paying zero in taxes, getting around it, so that they don't have to contribute. That ends with this bill. That's why they hate it. That's why they don't want it to pass. Because if the American people knew that they could get all these things and and it doesn't cost them anything, their taxes don't go up. In fact, if you're a middle-class person, if you're a working-class person, your taxes go down in this bill. So negotiations on this are ongoing. I mean, they're literally, as I am speaking, and as we are are now bringing in uh, our congressman uh, who's there in the halls of Congress right now, back and forth between the White House and Congress uh, to get this thing passed. And the reason I have Congressman uh, Ro Khanna on the episode here today is because I wanted to talk with a member of Congress who has been fighting the good fight in trying to keep as much of this $3.5 trillion legislation together. Everybody, Please welcome our good friend here on this podcast from California, United States Congressman Ro Khanna. Ro, welcome back to Rumble. Michael, it's my honor, and thank you for what you've been doing for the last uh, seven months since President Biden has been elected to really uh, help mobilize around these policies. Uh, you made a huge difference. Well, you know, President Biden has made that easy on a number of us, I think, because the fear that he would go into the White House and lean lean center or lean right did not happen. The opposite happened. And I've been so impressed and pleased with the strong stances that he has taken. And up until this week, he would not relent on all the things that more moderate conservative uh, Democrats and others were pushing him to change his mind on. But now here we are. So it's clear, I think, to everybody that we're not going to get everything we want. I don't know if I've ever in my political life able to say those words. (laughs) Well, we got everything we wanted. (laughs) But it seems like that you and the others have fought to keep as much of this as possible. And maybe maybe it's not 10 years uh, so the price is reduced to keep some people happy. But just give us a very quick update as to uh, where we're at today. And then I want to uh, ask you a couple of questions and, and we'll let you go back to the important work that you're doing today. Michael, first of all, I agree with you in the characterization of President Biden. As you, you know, I was a co-chair for Senator Sanders, but I told right. him this week uh, that uh, every time I hear him speak, I'm, I'm convinced he's more progressive than I thought he was. So he's really passionate about these policies. And when we do pass this, this is going to mean every kid in America finally gets preschool, something they've been doing in France very successfully. And 
you know, in France, what is shown is that by the time you get to first grade, people are on a level playing field. I mean, that would be transformational in this country if we could do that for every kid. It's going to mean childcare for working families and middle class families. It's going to mean seniors finally get dental, vision, and hearing. Oh, dental is dental is still in. Dental's in now. Dental, you know, the CM CMS is so bureaucratic that they have this whole process that every dentist has to certify, et cetera, and that would take years. And so what we're thinking of doing is a debit card, uh, which gives you about a thousand bucks, which you can use on dental. So it's not that every, you know, I mean, a root canal costs more than that, but at least it is a start. And I guess, Michael, my, the, the broader point I want to make is these are things that you and other progressives have been calling for for decades. This is, these right. are policies that we have been an outlier on. Every other democracy in, in the Western world has these policies. Paid family leave is going to be in there. So we can do this and set a totally different direction. Finally, we're saying we've got to invest in the working class and middle class. And I want to be candid with folks. Am I concerned that paid family leave may not be the 12 weeks? Yes. Uh, it should be more than the four weeks that's currently being negotiated. Negotiated. Anyone who knows someone who's been pregnant knows that four weeks is is ridiculous. Uh, but right. we're 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 going to have a compromise on these things. And uh, what I think we should focus on is we've finally broken through on these policies, and we can build on it. Uh, and it's a totally different way of looking at uh, our obligation and social contract in a democracy. So you are not depressed today, right? You haven't thrown the towel in on any of this. I'm not depressed. I'm 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 energized now. The one place where I'm concerned. Where, where I'm most anxious is on climate. Uh, and that is uh, because it is such a crisis and we need to go uh, to Glasgow. We need to have the president go with some leadership uh, that America is going to show that, is, that we're serious about hitting his goals of 50% reduction of emissions by 2030. And if the CEPP, the uh, Climate Energy Plan, uh, which would have created mandates and incentives for the uh, p- power companies is out because of mansion, uh, then we need to have an alternative there. Uh, we need to have something robust there. And that is something that the Progressive Caucus is pushing. Uh, Jared Huffman has been leading that on our for our caucus. Senator Tina Smith has been pushing it. She was the original author of the CEPP in the Senate. Uh, but that is a a, a red line. Climate is a red line for progressives. Not that it has to have the exact thing that uh, Manchin wants out, but that we have to be serious about that portion. And I, and to me, that is the one area where there's still a lot of ongoing negotiation. What, what do you think of these reports today that Manchin is uh, thinking of leaving the, the Democratic Party? Is there any truth to that? Or is this just a last minute uh, ploy to put just another gun uh, to our heads? I don't think there's uh, any uh, truth to that. I, I think maybe at some point he could have said, oh, I can become an independent and still caucus with Democrats. I mean, who knows? People say a lot of things and and, and someone could leak that or, or try to create an article. But, you know, I actually think it's more the Republicans uh, hopeful thinking that that would happen uh, right. and trying to throw any grenades and in, in what is very close to, to, to having a deal. And as they see that that's, uh, coming together, you know, they're going to try to disrupt it. So here's here's what I'm worried about, and I'm worried about what the American people are, are watching this week, last week, next week, and I'm especially worried about people that voted for uh, President Biden, who voted for Democrats in 2020, because they believed that things were going to happen, profound things, profound changes were going to, to happen, and it, it fired people up, and so many people came out who don't usually vote and came yep. out to vote. And Bernie was out there all across the country with Biden, getting you know everybody that voted for him uh, out there. And you and I and others very cautiously, but you know we jumped into the deep end of the pool uh, with the assurance that whether it was climate, whether it was the significant child tax credit, and also child care, elder care, all these things. And I, I've thought since the beginning of this year, since uh, Biden was inaugurated, that, you know what, everybody's doing all the hand-wringing, we're going to lose seats next year. No, we're going to gain seats because the American people will have had a year of this extra help with their children, 
with their parents and grandparents, with, with all these things that you guys have preserved uh, in this bill. And after a year of that, people are going to go, I want more of that. And the people that came out who normally don't vote, who voted last year, they can say, they've been wanting to say, wow, it was worth my time. I'm glad I just didn't, I, I didn't sit in my cynic's chair. I came out. If we break faith with them, Congressman, if we break faith with them on this, and none of these things really come through with any substance, if this isn't passed, the difficult time you and I and others are going to have next year, getting them out for the midterms and getting them and getting them out in 2024, that this is to me what these bills, yes, they're about all these specific things that are going to make life so much better for working people and for families and all that. But, but it's also, it's going to help guarantee the, 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 as the Republicans, as less and less and less of them, as less and less Americans are voting for them. We've gone from Gore winning the popular vote by half a billion to Hillary winning the popular vote by three million to Biden winning the popular vote by over seven million. That's the trend. The trend is with us. If we break faith, if, that, if we break that trend, the, the damage that this will do, if, if, and, and I applaud you and the others, and, not, and it isn't just the four members of the squad this time. It started a month ago with 60 Democrats in Congress saying, We're, we are not backing down on this. And then, and then more and more came on, and it was clear to the speaker. And then she came on, and, every, and then Biden backed you. It was just the whole thing was has been great to see, but if we if this doesn't succeed on the level it needs to succeed on, I fear I'm sorry to put a negative thing on this, but I and I don't want to scare people, but I believe that we might be doomed next year in our chance of getting just two more Senate seats, so we don't have this problem that we've had this time. Just two more Senate seats. There's there's a, I don't know a number, five Republicans that are not running for re-election. You know, we can win these seats, and, and, but we won't if we didn't deliver. Your, your honest reaction to that. Michael, I can't say it any more clearly or better than you just did. I mean, people say, Ro, aren't you most concerned about saving democracy uh, and Trump's big lie and the radicalization of the Republican Party? And I say, yes, I am. But just having the hearings on January 6th, which are so important, and just talking about uh, holding Trump accountable is not enough. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient. We have to, in addition to running against the big lie and running against the radicalized Republican Party, uh, give people a reason to vote for us. Uh, and that is about more than just the roads and bridges uh, and even broadband. We have to show that we mm -hmm. finally get it and are helping working families, middle-class families in this country. And that's what this bill will do. I mean, it means 300 bucks in the pocket of families with kids uh, going all the way up to the middle, upper middle class. They're finally going to get some help every month, money for their each kid. It's going to mean, uh, like we said, that they get childcare help. They're not going to ever have to pay more than 7% of their income on child care. Right now, people are paying 20, 25% on child care. Yes. It's go, you know, it's, it's, this is real stuff that they're going to see right away. And I agree with you. I, I, I think then the 22 elections are, is, are, the choice is going to be clear. Do you want this stuff to continue? Or if you put the Republicans in, they're going to try to repeal it. And the 24 elections will be, do you want this to continue and build on it or do you not? And so uh, I believe we have a very good chance if we get this done. If we don't, then we, we really uh, are at a very severe disadvantage in, in, in getting people's credibility. And so I know, look, when we vote for this, uh, I know there will be some people on the left who say, just vote against it. We didn't get enough. Uh, and I, I don't think that's right in terms of setting the direction on progressive policy. We held firm. We were ready to vote down the infrastructure bill when the commitments yes, weren't that there. That was clear. That was not a, that was not a fake out. It was clear, and I think that's what preserved the, the, the majority, at least, of what we've been attempting to do. And, and so, you know, in, instead of uh, three steps forward, it's maybe one and a half to two steps forward here. But I don't want to have to next year explain to people that, that what we've done now 
by depressing the vote, and if people don't understand what that term means, is, is that if we, we on the left, we uh, progressives, uh, liberals, Democrats, whatever you want to call yourself, President Biden, if, if the vote is depressed, meaning the vote for Biden, the Democratic vote for next year, where people just say, you know what, either, fuck it, I'm not going to vote, you know, I, they, they let me down, uh, we didn't get what we were supposed to get, or worse, this is what is more than likely will happen if we don't succeed strongly right now. What's going to happen next year is that people that voted for the Democrats and for Biden in 2020 are going to be not as enthused. And so they will vote. They will vote. But in 2020, they brought five of their friends with them. They brought five family members with them. They made sure they got out, not just their vote, but more of the vote. And that's why he, he doubled, more than doubled, what Hillary did in 2016. That won't happen, Congressman, if, if they'll vote next year, but it will be a depressed vote. They will vote not exactly happy with how this has turned out. And no matter how many times I say to them, look, if you let the Republicans win next year, you, know, you remember January 6th? Those people who were storming the Capitol building, they'll be storming the Capitol building. Uh, and when the new Congress is sworn in, they just won't have all that crazy gear and Viking horns and American flags to s stab people with. Uh, they will have suits and ties on, but it's the same damn insurrection that will be going on. And we will rue the day that we, we didn't fight for these things that would have inspired people to come out and vote next year. I'm so worried that what we do this week and next week is going to desperately affect the turnout next year. You're absolutely right. And, and, and that's why it's so important that we didn't just do the infrastructure bill, that we're actually going to deliver for things that are going to make people's lives better. And we need to continue to fight to make it as good as possible. That's an ongoing negotiation right now. I think the climate part is so critical, uh, one, because of the actual threat that exists to our planet, but also because, as you know, Michael, so many young people who came out, that's their number one issue. I mean, there, there's a group of young people right now uh, on a hunger strike outside the White House yes. on climate. And so uh, that's a place where we're still negotiating. Uh, we need to be clear that that it's unacceptable for the United States uh, to send President Biden to Glasgow at Glasgow and have uh, the, the, the least strong plan compared to the Europeans or even the Chinese. I mean, we need to send him uh, with a strong plan. And well, then it after like we, it looks like the, our side can't deliver. Even and when the majority of Americans support what we believe in, the vast, every poll, you know this, every poll, whether it's health care, child care, minimum wage, every damn poll says the American people agree with us, not the, not the Republicans, and, and not with Cinema and Manchin. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and they agree with us, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent. You know, here was the yes. interesting poll finding. I'm, I'm sure you know this, but I was shocked about it. They had a poll that said, uh, do you believe in universal preschool? And it said, okay, 65, 70% approve it. And then you ask the same question, do you believe in universal preschool and taxing the ultra rich to pay for it? And the number goes up to 80 to 90%. Like taxing the, yes. taxing the rich, taxing the ultra rich is actually good politics. And so when cinema is saying that she doesn't want to raise a dime on corporate tax rates or doesn't want to raise a dime on the wealthy, it's, it's just horrible politics. I mean, it's not just morally bad. It's, it's terrible politics. But we're, we're going to overcome that. We're going to get this passed. And, and then I think we do have a responsibility to be honest but, but positive. I mean, too often what happens is the, the after we pass these big things, you know, the Republicans, even whatever they pass, they call it the greatest thing ever. Uh, we uh, tend, tend to, as Democrats, be reflective. And sometimes we dwell on all that's not there. But I think this, we can really be proud, legitimately proud of what we're delivering to folks uh, so they know that uh, if they come out, if they continue to, to be uh, mobilized, that we will have more uh, wins for, for people. And what do we say today to our fellow progressives who are very upset at the fact that it seems like community college is, is out, the climate stuff, as you said? I mean, what, 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 I mean, you must have heard from a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear daily. I, I, I get it on Twitter. I get, I hear, yeah. I hear it all, all the time, but, but um, 
you know, but we all turned around a positive when we stood firm. You know, I'll share this. I mean, when the president was coming to speak to us, uh, to the House caucus at the end of September, when the speaker had set the deadline saying uh, we needed to have the vote on infrastructure, everyone in the caucus and all the moderates expected the president to come and said, say, we need to pass infrastructure. And the president said the exact opposite. He said, no, we're not going to do it until they're both bills. So amazed at him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. one of the first times the progressive caucus has actually stood firm and won. Right. So I, yes. I and that's not because of those of us in Congress. That's because of the progressive movement. And that's because President Biden saw that firsthand in the primaries. I mean, he's the difference between Biden and a lot of his colleagues is, uh, yeah, he may have been elected first in the 70s or 80s, like many of his colleagues, but he had to face the modern electorate in 2020. Many of these folks in the Congress and Senate haven't had to face that. So he saw firsthand that progressive energy and he gets it. Uh, and so I would say to, 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 to all of your listeners, you made an incredible difference. You've influenced the president. You've given us sort of the, the, the ability to have spine as a caucus. Continue to push for these things because we're still in a negotiation. Push for the things that you care most about. Uh, and then uh, let's con continue the fight after, after we get these wins. But know that if it weren't for you, we'd probably just have a bipartisan roads bridges bill, which was a Mitt Romney presidency. And you changed that, that direction. That's right. Biden came in like at a fourth, fifth, and sixth or whatever in those first three caucuses and primaries. He was not in the top three. Uh, Bernie won or tied uh, those three. And yes, everybody who participated in that had a huge impact on, and Biden could read the tea leaves very well and, and, and pivoted. So tell people who are listening, what can they do today, tonight, tomorrow? Because I think this is close. This is going to happen certainly by next week. What do they need to do right now so that their voices are heard? Well, first, they should be communicating with those of us in the Progressive Caucus, with Senator Sanders, uh, about what are the most important negotiation points for them. They should call the uh, White House to let them know what is the, the most important. They should let uh, senators, of those of uh, the listeners who are in Arizona or in West Virginia or other states, uh, should let their representatives know what is most important. This is the... This is still fluid. Yeah, this is still uh, it's something that is being negotiated. So the more people hear uh, from the grassroots these, that this is what matters, the better chance that's going to make it in uh, to the final piece of legislation. And then, you know, what I would hope uh, is that people will also say at the end of the day, we've got to pass this as long as it's progress and two steps forward and, and not sort of... Uh, have a, a, a nihilism where we don't do anything uh, and then and then we're in real trouble in 2022. So to people who are listening, the Capitol Hill switchboard, I want to write this down, but I will also put it on my podcast page here where you're listening, where you're listening to me. Um, the, the number uh, to the Capitol and a human being answers the phone. And you just have to ask for your member of Congress. If you don't know who that is, just give him or her the, the zip code when you get the operator. Uh, on the line, and they will send you to your member of Congress. That number is 202-224-3121. And then if it's busy too much, then here's a second number, very similar, 202-225-3121. And they will put you through. They'll also put you through to your, your one of your two senators or both of them. And Congressman, it, it, people say, oh, my, my, my Congressman's Ro Khanna. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to call him. But tell them that even if they're, they're in a blue state, they have a very progressive senator or member of Congress, they still need to hear from you. Absolutely. You will share that with other members that your, your switchboard is being melted down. Yeah, and it makes a difference. Look, one of the reasons I keep emphasizing climate is not just that I believe it. It's that that's what I've heard the most calls from, the most passion from in, in my district. So we have a lot of priorities as, as, as progressives, but if there are things that you are deeply committed to, that you want to see in this bill, that you're reading about and you're really concerned about, uh, it helps to call because it helps us to see what the priorities uh, should be when we go represent the progressive voice in, in, in meetings. And so it makes a big difference uh, to call. I think people 
have a false sense of their voice not mattering. It, you, you know, if you have a hundred calls into a member of Congress's office, uh, trust me, the member of Congress knows and pays attention. So uh, it makes it, it yeah, makes just a hundred, just a hundred, just a hundred. A hundred. A hundred. I, it if, is a little bit mind, calls, mind blowing. Yeah, I would know. I mean, my staff would tell me they share those emails, they share those calls, they say, "Here, here's what we're hearing about." So I think sometimes people have this sense that, oh, I don't know if it matters. And I'm telling you, as a member of Congress, it matters. We follow it. You know, we follow, frankly, the tweets. Other members may not admit it. But, you know, if people are beating me up on Twitter, I know. I mean, some people, they act too cool. They don't want to admit it. But it all that stuff matters. And it, it, it makes a difference. And you should continue to do it. Right. Because if, if like <laughs> some of the tweets you're getting now, I can see that even though you are you are at the uh, the front of uh, at the barricades for uh, uh, what we've done to our planet you, you can only read so many tweets that, that say if this isn't in the bill you are you you Ro Khanna, are killing the planet it's like you're a human being and you will pay attention to that and 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 you're already giving 100 110% you know, the rest of the afternoon, you might give it 120 because you see of all the things people are writing or calling you about, the number one thing is the end of this planet. And that's got to give you uh, uh, some fuel to your engine. It absolutely does. It. And, you know, I don't take, I know some people get said today about the Twitter stuff. I don't take any of the criticism, even if they call me a sellout or nothing personally, because at the end of the day, Michael, being a member of Congress, of the world's greatest superpower puts you in like 0.00001% of privilege in humanity. And you should be criticized. You should be held accountable. You should be pushed. So what I'm saying is, uh, you know, you can think about what the most effective different people have different ways of being effective uh, and, and influencing them. But that passion, that passion from the base, that's what moves stuff. And, and it influences me too, I'm sure. I'm sure when I get massive push on, on one direction of policy, I, I take that more seriously. So it's it's great that your listeners are so engaged and, and this is the time to be engaged. And are, are so important, these, these voting rights bills, this is just so, so debilitating to see, uh, to think that this isn't going to happen. And all because of the filibuster, the th- not even the filibuster, the threat of the filibuster. This has to go. The filibuster has to go. One of my hosts, Michael, is after we get the economic agenda, maybe uh, the White House can be more vocal on the filibuster. Maybe they, they can really push that because we won't be as uh, dependent on a couple senators' votes. And so uh, but that is equally important uh, to 2022 or 24. I mean, if you, you know, you know how close those states were in Arizona, Georgia, and now you have those state legislatures basically disenfranchising people yes. who voted yes obviously they're they're not dumb they're doing it for a reason they 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 know that in a fair fight they they're not winning those states and so they know this is imagine if you were a republican you already know no matter how dense you are you already know the majority of americans don't want you running the country the republicans have lost what is it seven of the last eight presidential elections in the popular vote the vast majority of Americans look, add up all the votes of the congressional districts of the Senate seats is hugely democratic in terms of how people are voting. They know their time is up, their days are numbered, and they are trying to protect themselves and their wealthy sponsors as desperately as they can because they know the American people don't agree with them on any of the main issues. Every single one of them, as you said, 60, 70, even 80 percent now of the American public is against what the Republicans stand for and is for what Biden and the Democrats stand for. So that's got to be a lonely place to be. And and yet they've, they've decided to deal with their loneliness by concocting schemes and scams and to uh, uh, affect the vote in such a maligned and immoral way. And that, it, I really just want to say that really that's the only way you can win is essentially by cheating. That's the way. That's the way, you know. Or having a, a, your your the leader of your party lie every single day, make up, just make up crap uh, from your your fully vaccinated leader, 
just want to keep saying that over and over again to all the people who've lost loved ones because they believed Herr Leader uh, about the vaccine. He's fully vaccinated. You know, Michael, so I, was, I was on Fox News uh, a couple of days ago or Sunday, and before me, Governor Abbott from Texas was on. And of all the things he said, he said some awful things about people coming here and seeking asylum. But of all the things that said, he said, what bothered me the most is he was out there saying, well, there's all this evidence of people getting harmed by the vaccine. And there's all this evidence of uh, people having uh, mm. severe reactions. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, he's fully vaccinated. You know, he's not saying that to his family. You know, he's not saying that to his close friends, but he's out there spreading that misinformation to the public. I mean, it's just unconscionable. And, you know, and historians, they will not, they will not understand. They'll have to have like huge seminars, white papers. They'll have to do all this study and they'll bring anthropologists in. How was it that there was a political party that through the things they said, the lies that they spoke about this vaccine during a worldwide plague, that they were out to kill the voters and the members of their own party through these lies. You'd think it'd be the opposite. You'd think they'd want every conservative and Republican alive for next year. <laughs> They'll never, you know, really, they will not, historians will not know. We're going to have to leave behind a note or something to explain this to the future, how there was a political party hell-bent on killing its own voters. Absolutely uh, stunning. Just a, just one or two quick uh, things here. So on the, on the filibuster, people want to write President Biden and, and get him behind this. I think he's already there. Just write him at whitehouse.gov. Just go to that page, whitehouse.gov, and there'll be a, a, a way for you to actually send a note to President Biden. The final thing is, I guess, I, I have to ask you, so you've been hanging out with Paris Hilton, and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I shouldn't laugh because actually, why don't you explain? Because what you what you're doing is so important and so critical in support of protecting children. You know, Michael, well, I'm not a pop culture person, and my pop culture knowledge is usually terrible. But I uh, was back home, and a friend of mine said, "You know, Paris Hilton wants to meet you on this issue." And I said, "Okay, fine. Let me have coffee." And I had no idea. She starts going into her story. You know, she was sent to one of these congregate care facilities because she, her parents thought that she needed some rehabilitation as a teenager. And when she went there, uh, she basically uh, was abused. I mean, she was put in solitary confinement. Uh, she was sexually harassed. People would look at her naked in the shower and the supervisors were looking at, uh, at her. She was not allowed to speak at times. And then when her parents would come to visit, everything was, was fine. And it turns out that this is happening to hundreds of thousands of kids uh, across this country. Their parents may send them or the juvenile detention center send them to these facilities, institutions, and they think they're fine, but there is so much systematic uh, abuse. And I give Paris a lot of credit for saying, I'm going to tell my story because I was relatively privileged. And if this could happen to my family, Think about all the working class families. Think about the families of uh, communities of color. Think about gender and sexually diverse uh, uh, kids and what's happening to them. And, uh, you know, we're going to get something done in Congress to have a Bill of Rights uh, for kids who are going to these uh, institutions. Well, that's admirable. And thank you for doing that. Kids don't get to vote. They don't, so they don't really have a voice. And so adults have to stand up for them and and thank you and Paris Hilton and the others, you know, for, uh, for doing that. And just in closing, please share this. And if the people listening to this don't mind me speaking on their behalf, there are millions, millions of us looking toward these bills, especially the, what I call the human infrastructure bill. We know that when our fellow Americans are taken care of by government, something they are not used to, when they can maybe finally for the first time in their lives trust government and be grateful. You mentioned the, the $300 uh, uh, per kid. That $300, you know, maybe some people listen to this don't think that that's a lot of money, but let me tell you something. You know, we've talked on this podcast how the majority of Americans now don't have $400 to their name. Like if, if they had if they had to get their car fixed, if someone passed away and they had to get on a plane and go across the country, they don't have the money to do that. That's the, Amer the America we live in now. 
to, to, to that three hundred dollars is a godsend, and it, it practically doubles what they only have in their pockets to pay for any anything that happens in their life uh, right now. So this is all so important, and I want to just give you the final uh, the word here, if you could. I, I watched Bernie's live stream last night. What's in the damn bill? <laughs> you, if you ever want to get Bernie Sanders to, to, to really go off with what he thinks, just, yes. <laughs> just ask him about the media and how the media covers oh, these I know. things. Oh, my God. I campaigned for him in his very first race that he won back in 1990 up in Vermont. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, I've known Bernie a long time. So I'm not going to ask you to do a Bernie impersonation. But uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you are the congressman from, the, uh, from Silicon Valley. I, I, you know, there's, that, that is beyond my talent, Michael. I, I, but the, uh, <laughs> right. But if you could, bullet point, just bullet point, what is in the damn bill and let, so that people can today call, text, write their friends, their family, get online, share this with people, tell them the goodness that is within our reach. But it will not happen if we don't make it happen. The Republicans, I, one thing I have great respect for them, they without the support of the American people, still get to run so much of this country. And it's stunning to me, but that must end. So please, in our final moments, what's in the damn bill? Michael, I appreciate you giving me that chance. First, the 300 bucks per kid in per your kid, family. Not per family, per kid. Per kid. And that means for, you talk to fat folks, I'm sure you did, that means uh, books, that means school supplies, that means nutrition. For babies, it means baby food diapers. I mean, this is making a transformative difference. It's, you know, people talk about the statistic of a lowered uh, poverty by almost 50%, but you talk to folks about what that 300 bucks is doing. It's going to be every month per kid. Then you've got universal preschool. You know, as a father, I see this because I've got young kids that are in, in preschool. That's transformative. In France, every kid goes to preschool at three. And by the time they're in first grade, they actually all start out at the same place. In our kid, in our society, by first grade, half our population doesn't have a fighting chance because they never had preschool. This is going to make preschool universal. This is going to mean for the seniors, they're going to get hearing aids without having to go bankrupt or, or, or going to serious debt. They're going to be able to get gl glasses to see. They're going to be able to go to a dentist and have some support so that they're not getting uh, billed, crazy bills for a tooth extraction or a root canal or all the routine dental work. And that can be thousands of dollars totally uncovered. This is going to mean paid family leave finally. Uh, you know, your your kid gets sick or you get sick or you get pregnant and, or are delivering and you're going to finally be able to get paid leave. I mean, uh, unbelievable that our society doesn't have that. This is going to have the biggest investment in clean tech and solar and wind that we've ever had as a government. Now, we need to do uh, a, a lot and it's probably not nearly enough to actually tackle climate change, but think about that the first time our government is going to make a substantial investment in renewable energy and childcare. You know, every person I talk to if it, in, in the working class, most people, they say their biggest fear, biggest challenge is childcare, taking almost 25%, 30% of their salary. This is going to make sure of the, of your family income, you're never have, going to have to pay more than 7% on childcare. And for many people, it will be fully subsidized. So that's what's in the bill. Let me just end with this, Michael, because I, you know, I admire Bernie so much and, and, and you. Uh, I think Bernie Sanders, even though he never became president, uh, is going to be seen as a historic figure in American politics. I mean, yes. he helped, he really helped change the debate on a lot of this. And the reason he was able to change the debate is because of people like you who've been fighting the fight for the last 25 years. And I just want you and your listeners to understand this. The reason we're getting this is not because of the think tanks. It's not because you got smart people in Congress, though well-intentioned. It's because people mobilized. It's because people are mobilizing. That's the only thing that is shifting policy in this country. And mobilized voices beat special interests in power. Not all the time, but over the long run they do. And that the movement should just be so proud uh, that we have made this progress and are finally going to deliver on things that were long overdue. We have to do that because we, we have to keep the House and get more seats next year, and we have to strongly hold this, have the Senate by 54 seats, 56 seats, whatever. We have no choice. 
But if we don't have the tools to go out there and convince people who didn't want to vote last time, if we don't have those tools, if this doesn't pass the right way, now we're in an uphill climb like we wouldn't believe. And and so, and for as for Bernie, I honestly, and again, I try to tell people, I'm not, I'm not saying Bernie has said this to me, but I'm just telling you, I have this image of most nights, Joe Biden, he's got his jammas on and he's going to bed, he's got his warm glass of milk, and he and Bernie are on the phone in the final conversation of the day with each other. I think what Bernie has done with his good friend, and he does mean that, his good friend, Joe Biden, is as he, he has carried the flag for the majority of Americans. I don't even want to say progressive because we're now the mainstream role. I mean, we're this the, the majority of the Americans agree with everything you're fighting for. So thank you for saying all that. Thank you for your kind words. And it's been an honor, again, to have you on the congressman from California, as I said, the congressman from Cupertino. <laughs> <laughs> what Bernie way, says, he says, you represent Silicon Valley and you're for me. There must be something good about you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I, I, here's, here's what I think, that you and your fellow progressives in Congress are so radical, so radical, that you are going to succeed and seeing that our elderly citizens will be able to hear, see, <laughs> and chew their food. I don't know where you came up with that radical democratic socialist idea that old people should be able to chew, see, and hear, and, and that young people should have, uh, should have the equal footings to start before they go to kindergarten. God bless you for this. I pray you succeed. And I will do my best to have my voice heard. And I ask everybody listening to pick up the phone, even if you've already done it, do it again and again, 202-224-3121, the Capitol Hill switchboard. They'll put you right through. Trust me. You'll be shocked. You think, oh, I'm actually talking to a congressman's office? Yes. Yes, that is exactly how it still works. Uh, let's keep this democracy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much. Congressman Ro Khanna from California for being our guest here today on Rumble. Take care. Be well. Well, that was great uh, talking to the congressman. I know he's very busy fighting for us right now. So uh, let's not only wish him the best, but let's uh, let's call our members of Congress, our senators, and drop a note uh, to the president uh, to say, hang tough, get as much as you possibly can for the people of this country who are in desperate need of the things that are in this bill. Um, before we go on to our, our, our last uh, segment here uh, today, where I'm, I'm going to play some of the voicemails that you've sent me uh, and I've recorded, and uh, I think people will, will enjoy listening to these, but I want to thank two more underwriters here today. One is Truebill. This is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need or want, or like me, simply forgot that I had subscribed. Truebill's app allows you to see all your subscriptions in one place and keep the ones you want and then cancel the ones you don't want. You must have had this happen to you. I mean, I can't tell you. I go down through my uh, credit card statement or whatever. And I'm, I'm still paying for this. I don't even use it. I don't even read it. So instead of randomly hoping that you'll run across something you're paying for that you really shouldn't be paying for, the true bill has it right there, all in one place for you, and it works. Over 2 million users have benefited from using Truebill, and it's helped save them now $100 million. Like Billy, uh, who wrote in to say that in a matter of seconds, I saved $660 for the year on my DirecTV bill. I saved $120 for the year on my Sirius XM bill, and I saved $840 a year on car insurance. Oh my God, on car insurance. See, this is, man, this is how these companies, they make a lot of money because, you know, we don't pay attention. We don't check back in. Just start canceling all these unused subscriptions right now at truebill.com slash, everybody say it, rumble. Truebill.com slash rumble. Go there and it will save you upwards to hundreds, if not thousands a year by making sure you're not paying for these things that you don't want anymore. Truebill.com slash rumble. Thank you, Truebill, for being underwriters of this podcast 
and and supporting my voice. And finally, our first uh, underwriter, Anchor. Okay, so we're we're back here, and uh, as you know, on my platform page here for this podcast, there is a way for you to leave me a voicemail, a one-minute voicemail. And as I've done in the past, occasionally, I will play the voicemails that you've left me. And I've picked out a few of my favorites here uh, from the last a month or so. So um, I'm just going to play them as is. Um, I don't answer voicemails, and I, I don't have time. But I do listen to every voicemail uh, that's left for me. So please send me a voicemail. I love it. And, uh, and maybe you'll end up here on Rumble. So, uh, Basil, if we're ready, can we... Uh, begin uh, playing these wonderful voicemails sent to me here at Rumble with Michael Moore. Hi, Michael. This is Pam Hall, City of Midland Councilman, Ward 1. I heard your broadcast on Rumble with India Walton. I very much support her as a candidate and am very happy that she was on as a guest. I, I share a similar story Um, and can relate to the difficulties and the attacks that come when running for office. It isn't easy. Um, So looking forward to hearing more that you have on your show, and we'll look forward to helping India in any way I can. Thank you. Hey, Mike. This is uh, Arthur from Vancouver again. Of course, being not an American, I can't very well contribute, but I was inspired, and so I rewrote the lyrics for Buffalo Soldier, don't worry if I run out of time here, I'll email you the lyrics and you can run Buff- Buffalo Mayor yourself sometime. India Walton for a Buffalo Mayor. Oh, India Walton for a Buffalo Mayor. Oh, we want an India Walton. She the one we call on. Take us to the future. Lovely like Niagara. Old man Brown, he'd been running this town. Thought that to Baden, there was a too big step down. Hi, Mike. It's Nurse Kelly from Eugene. I've got a couple of ideas. I see all this TV footage of smug politicians walking around in public unbothered, and it makes me angry. I don't think it's right that these corrupt assholes get to live the good life while they're ruining our country. They do not deserve to eat at nice restaurants walk through airports unchallenged, or play golf at their local country club. We need to get more aggressive. Not violent, but aggressive. We need to harass the hell out of these people and not give them a moment's peace. If we're clogging up senators' offices, accosting them at airports and restaurants, picketing their homes and boycotting the corporations that are bribing them, we will get their attention. Another idea is a TikTok challenge, putting for politicians. Have people post videos throwing pudding on them as they walk around in public. I don't know if it's legal, and of course, I don't advocate breaking any laws, but it would be totally hilarious. Ciao. Hello, Michael. My name is Joy, and I live in California, and I'd just like to say that it is taking literally one month for my family members to receive my mail through US, the, the U.S. postal system. Is anyone looking into that? I really would like for someone to look into that. I'm concerned consistently their mail is one month delayed. I appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for all you do. Love you, Mike. Bye. Hi, Michael. This is Technical Sergeant Joanne Griffin. I am an active duty service member stationed overseas again in Japan and I've been listening to your podcasts and following you for many years. I appreciate your work. And thank you very much for sharing Stephen Donsinger's story. I had no idea. It's ridiculous and unjust. And I wanted to let you know that I appreciate you getting the word out because that enabled someone like me, who was clueless of his situation, to make a donation and to write an email to the Attorney General which I just did. So thanks for everything that you do. And I appreciate all the support you give folks in this world that really need it. Hey, Michael, thank you so much for the podcast. I'm listening to the Donzinger one now. 
It's horrendous. And I think the one thing we can do, spread the word that Chevron is buying our criminal justice system. They're buying it. That'll piss them off. It'll piss everybody off. And it'll get a lot of people's attention. Chevron is buying the court system. Anything goes as long as you've got the dough. Thanks, Mike. Great job. Hi, Michael. I really enjoyed your rumble last night, your interview with Stephen Donzinger, and I've been following his story for several weeks now, and I'm very concerned. I was hoping that maybe you and Jeff, when this COVID stuff is over, could go down to Ecuador and really get into what exactly the damage is down there because nothing has been done. They haven't been given the money to fix it. And I was hoping that would have been more stressed. Please give my best to Jeff and all the crew and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Hi, Mike. I was really happy to see you posting something on the Donzinger travesty of justice. Uh, the poor guy's been under house arrest. He's a hero. He's an environmental lawyer uh, and energy companies put him in jail, not really um, the U.S. justice system which now should take over this case and release the guy. Let's all walk with him outside once he's free, and I hope that'll be soon, and I'm glad you're publicizing this. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that was great. I enjoy all of that. Uh, great comments. Much appreciated by me to have this connection uh, with you. And I want to thank Congressman Ro Khanna for uh, being uh, our guest here on the podcast today. I want to thank all of you who have uh, subscribed to my Substack, the free subscribers, the paid members, whatever you are. I'm greatly appreciative, for all of you, for participating uh, in the things that I'm trying to get out there right now. We are, we are in, as you know, a dark moment in this country, on this planet, and there is much, much work for all of us to do. And the fact that I know that there are tens of thousands of you listening right now, and by the time this is up and out for a month, there's going to be 150, 200,000 of you. But we don't want to mention numbers anyway. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for participating in Rumble, um, in my Substack, and all the things that you're doing in your daily life uh, to stand up, to speak out, to participate, to call you are members of, of Congress and your senators, all of that. We are not going to back down. We are not uh, going to live the way that we've had to live in the past. We are creating a better and a new country. And there's so many things, as you know, whether it's voting rights, the horrific condition of our planet, so much. But I am optimistic. I believe together uh, we can make some serious changes here. And I thank you, all of you, uh, for participating uh, with me and letting me participate with you. It means a lot. And I will see you again next week with our next episode of Rumble with Michael Moore. And this Sunday, I will post on Substack my uh, letter of the week, my letter to you. Uh, so please uh, go to michaelmoore.com and become part of my Substack. That's it, everyone. Thank you to Basil Hamden, our executive producer here, to Nick Quaz for being our editor and sound engineer today, to Donald Bornstein, the Swiss Army knife of this uh, project, jack of all trades, uh, to Harrison Malkin for doing uh, the research and, and helping us out with a whole bunch of things. Gratitude to all of you and to all of you who are listening. We'll see you Sunday on Substack, and we'll see you next week here on Rumble. Rumble.